It's two o'clock. You ready? Yeah. Let's do this. All right. All right. Yeah. That was. Thanks. Yeah. Great. That was awesome. I guess that was. That was like both like less than and more than I was expecting. So that was fantastic. Uh, all right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm the uh, Open Geospatial Data Lead at Amazon Web Services. So first question, because I've gotten in trouble when I don't do this piece. Uh, OK, and I was a teacher, so I think I can think this through. Raise your hand if you do know what cloud services are. All right, that's like pretty much all of you, except for the people looking on their phones who aren't probably listening anyways. Oh, close to the mic. Can you hear me? OK, I got it. Close to the mic. All right, here I am. If I move, all right, thanks. Good. All right, if I move, just somebody yell at me or make, make signals like that. Uh, all right, so yeah, AWS is a cloud services part of Amazon. Um, so, but I'm going to skip over that uh, and get right into it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about OSM as a public data set on AWS. Um, OSM is already a public data set, although if you were here for Kevin's talk, apparently maybe there was some talk this morning that, I don't know, that how open it is maybe is in debate. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we mean by a public data set on AWS, and then I'm going to talk about a couple of its uses, uses and just sort of um, give you some examples from what I see. Um, so I think one of the questions that I get a lot when I sort of give this presentation is uh, why does AWS care about open data? Um, quite simply, we care about open data because our customers care about open data. Um, so just sort of an example of, of, of the way this works is a lot of our public sector customers, so these are normally government institutions, research organizations, universities, nonprofits, they look to the cloud to make their data highly available in sort of an efficient manners, right? And then we have a lot of customers, generally in the commercial sector. Digital Globe is up here as an example. Uh, and I didn't know, I mean, I put this together before I knew Kevin was going to be in the same session. Uh, but Digital Globe looks, the customers like Digital Globe look to use this data quite a lot. Uh, and Esri, who was just up here speaking uh, right before me, they're another group that could go on this slide, right? So we have a lot of customers that look to uh, use the data when it's made available in the cloud. And both those groups, Digital Globe and Esri, are interesting for another reason. Because in addition to using data that is made available through the public data sets program, they also make data available through the public data sets program in AWS. So when we think about how to make data available, right, sort of our end goal is to help when customers say, hey, we want to share our data in the cloud, my job is to help them for the geospatial data figure out how to best do that. But the truth of the matter is uh, we're a big believer in Joy's Law, and probably the people that know best how to do that aren't sitting on my team, right? So how can we work with customers to figure this out? Well, that's where the public data sets program comes in. So we work with a whole bunch of customers. This is a non-exhaustive list. Um, they're just a bunch of pretty logos on a slide. Uh, but we work with a lot of customers to, to make their data and different types of data sets available on AWS. So the public data sets program as a whole is something like 15, 16 petabytes of data, uh, which is it's a big number, right? Um, but the data sets compromise all the all different types of data from genomics data to data that's appropriate for machine learning to geospatial data, which is I focus on, so there's a lot of satellite imagery. Uh, and more importantly for this conversation, uh, OpenStreetMap is up there as a data set as well, right? So um, this is a view in our registry of open data on AWS. Uh, I'm legally obligated to not say Rota too much because that's like a trademarkable thing. So I need to say registry of open data on AWS whenever I refer to it. Um, but this is what the entry for OpenStreetMap looks like. Uh, and so this is the weekly updated planet file. Uh, this is actually work that's done by Seth Fitzsimmons to make sure that this data shows up there uh, as it should. Um, and then I sort of uh, alluded to this earlier, but we're not, for a lot of these data sets, um, we're not just looking to make the data available from wherever it was, which for a lot of these data sets is just on an FTP server somewhere. We're not just looking to put it into sort of uh, a nicer looking FTP server on AWS, right? A lot of times we ask the question, how can we make this data better available? What sort of tweaks can we do it, do to it to make it more easy to analyze in the cloud? In the case for OSM, we worked with Seth, uh, and this data is actually taken out of its normal format and put it into an ORC or ORC file, right? So this is a columnar data store. Uh, if you want more information about this, uh, you can either read the blog post that Seth wrote here that's linked on the bottom of the page, or he's sitting uh, halfway in the back there. Uh, so he can give you more information about that. But what this allows you to do is more easily query it uh, and work with it in the cloud, right? And so I'll show an example of that later. 
But we've got these sorts of pages for all the data sets that we have available in the public data sets program. And again, that's at registry.opendata.aws. And one thing I want to call out here is if you see in the bottom left hand corner, um, we look to highlight use cases of this data, right? Uh, we firmly believe that the easiest way for people to figure out how to work with the data is to see how others are using the data. So we always link to when we can find them, blog posts, tutorials, examples of products using the data so people can see how it's used in action to help them work better with the data. Um, and this is publicly editable on GitHub. So if you have something to add here, if you're using any of the OSM data on AWS or any of the other data sets that show up in the registry of open data, um, please go ahead and make a pull request to add your use case so other people can see it. And the other thing that I want to point here is on the right hand side, there's a resources list. And so this is giving you uh, information on where you can actually find this data, but one of those resources is not the location of the data, but is actually a location of a programmatic topic that you can subscribe to so that you can have your own infrastructure notified whenever there's new data coming into the coming in uh, to the, the bucket where this data lives, right? And so in this case, this happens once a week um, when the data gets updated and new data comes in. But uh, for some of our other data sets, like radar data, so we make the NOAA NEXTRAD data available as well, there's about a million notifications that go out a day, right? There's a lot of data going into that bucket. So it depends on which data set you're looking at and how frequently it gets updated. Uh, but there, we're always trying to make it easier for people to work with this data in the cloud. So broadly speaking, the open data program makes more data more available to more people. And specifically around geospatial data, um, we have sort of uh, coalesced a lot of our efforts here uh, under something called Earth on AWS. And so if you go to the link, you can see more information there. But basically, it's where we sort of bring together a number of our large geospatial data sets. So like I said, we've got um, uh, terrain tiles there, a bunch of satellite imagery from different public missions. Um, the OSM data is there, there's air quality data I'll talk about in a little bit, but just a number of data sets that are related to, to within the geospatial field. Um, but then also, I think importantly, it's not just the data, but we also have customers speaking about how they're using the data, right? So we obviously have a number of events and we have customers speak about how they're using the data in the cloud, uh, which again, I think is just as important, it's as important to know how to use the data as it is to have access to the data. So. I want to speak a little bit about some of the use cases um, of OSM when it's made available in AWS. Uh, and, and I think you're, you're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of uh, companies or, or other users talk about how they're using it. So I'm not necessarily going to talk to you about a bunch of the companies that are using uh, OSM data on AWS. Uh, a number of them are here and they'll sort of talk about it themselves. So I'm actually going to talk about something slightly different but still using OSM on AWS. Um, and, and this is around something that I've been thinking about recently which is sort of um, like a, um, a prototype or a thought experiment around a disaster response pipeline, right? Like what would this look like? And so to sort of set a goal for myself, I was thinking, uh, okay, if I want to design something to provide a meaningful, meaningful, actionable information to people responding in the field uh, to earthquakes, right? So the reason I chose earthquakes is because USGS has uh, earthquake feed, so that's our geological survey in the US. Uh, they have an earthquake feed, it's an RSS feed, so uh, it'll tell you when there's earthquakes going, around, going on around the world. Uh, I will tell you, uh, there are a lot. Uh, when I actually hooked this up, I was like, okay, there's a lot of earthquakes going around in the world uh, at any one time. So. Um, this is just a very large schematic. I don't really expect you to be able to take too much from this. I'll zoom in on a couple pieces here in a little bit. But um, basically what this shows you is sort of an end-to-end -end pipeline of what you could do if you were listening to an earthquake feed and you said, okay, when something's above a certain magnitude, I want to start taking some actions. Right? And so there's a lot of actions that you might want to take. Uh, I'm not giving that whole talk, so I'm only going to pick out a few pieces there. Right? So one of the first things you might want to do if we looked at this is, um, as I mentioned, uh, we've got something like 15 petabytes of data available. Um, not all of that is appropriate for disaster response, right? But some of it is. So the genomics data probably isn't going to make much sense to access uh, when you're trying to respond to earthquakes. Uh, but for example, Landsat imagery, Sentinel imagery, if DG is opening up imagery for the, for the event, that imagery might be something you might want to work with, right? And so with this sort of pipeline, as soon as you see an event come in that's above your threshold, I just said magnitude 5.0 for, for my prototype, but you can start taking action on that. And one of the things you might want to do is start moving some of that data around so you have faster access to it, right? And so you can start moving some of the imagery around. But what you also might want to do is start getting contextual information. So you can query OSM data. 
right? And so the work that Seth has done has given us the OSM data sitting in AWS in the cloud in a manner that's very easy to query, right? And so how would you do this? Well, you can just write a SQL query, right? And so this is using our service called Athena, uh, which just wraps other open source projects like Presto, um, and it'll do a distributed query on top of the data sitting in the S3 bucket, right? So through our public data sets program, this data is being made available and updated in an S3 bucket in an object store, uh, and the latest data is coming there every week. You can run whatever query you want on top of that data, right? And so this is just an example if you wanted to get all the health facilities in, 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 a, in a bounding box here, right? And our service will take care of scaling up the, the servers that you need to do that query, give you back the result, and then the servers go away. So the important thing to understand about this model here, sort of the pricing model, is that you're only paying for the amount of data that you're scanning, and you don't need to have any servers running. Nobody needs to have any servers running, right? So you're not paying for a long-lived server, you're not maintaining a long-lived server when you're not making any of the queries. You only need to pay when you make a query. So you pay a couple cents, you've got your answer, and then you don't need to worry about it anymore, right? The data is being updated for you and it's sitting there in a public data set on AWS. Uh, you can also interact with it in a bunch of other ways, but this is sort of just one of the, the, the cool examples, I think. And you can use this, obviously, if you're trying to get information uh, about what health facilities are around the epicenter of an earthquake, and then you can set up other things to start calling them or alerting them. Uh, although, I, whenever I say this, I think it's very funny because, like, my prototype doesn't really work here because I would presume they would know that an earthquake just happened right near them. But, you know, you can just go with it for prototype purposes. So. I think one of the things that people say a lot is um, it, when I start having this disaster response thing is like, oh, hey, uh, like the cloud's great, everyone loves the cloud. Um, I'm sure if I asked you, 100% of you would say the cloud's great and you love the cloud, thank you. Um, but it doesn't really work in disaster response context because we're in the field and we don't have any connectivity, right? Because generally you think like I need connectivity to use the cloud. Well, there's two things. One is that the cloud can actually work quite well in low, connected, co low connectivity situations. You do not want to be moving large amounts of data back and forth, that's true, but if you're just trying to get an answer, answers are generally very small. While answers might take a lot of data to generate, an answer can sometimes be very small. So if you have any sort of network connectivity and you can connect to the cloud and you can say, I know that there's petabytes of data or terabytes of data that I want to query, I just need to write, I just basically need to send my little query up to the cloud, that's like no data at all, right? It all runs in the cloud on the powerful machines next to all the data, and then you just need the connectivity to bring the data back down, the answer back down. So it's not as bad as you might think. If you have no connectivity, well then yes, that situation's not gonna work for you. But if you just have low connectivity, it's not necessarily a deal breaker, right? But the other thing is that we do have other mechanisms to allow you to work with data in a cloudy way in a local context, right? So what would this look like? So this is actually called a snowball edge. So a snowball edge is a physical device. It's a hardened device. Uh, we have videos of it getting things blown up next to it. Um, the, the military has used this, so I assume that they do their own testing and have found it fine. Um, it's 100 terabytes of storage on the device, and it also has compute capabilities on the device. So if you're familiar with AWS, this is basically EC2 and S3 that are uh, available on the device. You can just use the CLI, and when you ask the device, like, hey, what do you have on you? It'll tell you it's got EC2 and S3 on the device. Um, if you're not familiar with AWS, this basically means you've got compute capabilities and storage capabilities, right? So 100 terabytes of storage uh, and a fair amount of compute as well. You can also put these things together. Um, you can cluster them together for more storage and more compute. Uh, it's rain and dust resistant, so you can run it in humid environments. You can stick down the cover and it can go through a sandstorm. Um, so good luck to you if you're in a sandstorm, but the device will be fine. Um, and so, like, wh what does this look like, right? So we've got this device, um, it's just under 50 pounds, which I think was a requirement for people to put on their backs. Um, Seth has lugged it around, he has checked it into uh, an airline. Uh, did you, did it go in the, oh, you checked it, so you didn't have to put it, yeah, yeah, right, so. Um, so it, it's fine, you can just move these things around, they're very sturdy. Um, it doesn't have wheels. I don't know why it doesn't have wheels. It seems like it should have wheels. It does not have wheels, maybe a V2. Um, but uh, what does this look like, right? So you have this device. Um, these are all in our centers, our regions around the world, and they can be ordered by you just like any of our other services. So you can go in the console, and just like you say, I wanna spin up a compute instance for some amount of time, you can say, I want one of these devices for some amount of time, right? 
So what, what might that look like, right? And I'm gonna show you some stuff that customers have done, uh, and I'll try to call them out. Uh, I don't want this to seem like it's something that exists. This, this exists today, this is our thing, this exists today. But what I'm about to show you, I don't wanna make it look like it's a finished thing and that it's something that's on, that we're doing. So I just wanna make sure to caveat that and I'll try and call it out here. Um, but so this is actually work that Element 84 has done to sort of mock up what this sort of ordering process might look like. So for us, you would just go to the normal AWS console and order it. But if you wanted to have a more sort of experience tailored to sort of ordering data for disaster response, what might that look like? Uh, and so this is just done around Puerto Rico. And so um, you would say like, hey, this is the region that I wanna look at. And then you would say like, okay, what data sets do I have access to, right? If I've got a license to DG imagery, put that DG imagery on the box, right? Because here's the thing, that DG imagery is sitting in the same facility where this device is sitting. So this isn't the case that you're just downloading hundreds of terabytes of DG imagery. It's the case that we're taking data that already lives in our servers right next to the device and putting it on the device, if you have a license, of course, or if it's been opened up for disaster response purposes. Um, you could also say like there's a lot of other public data sets like Sentinel-2. You might want to use synthetic aperture radar data so you get Sentinel-1 data on there. Uh, you might be looking at a flooding situation so you want the latest flood models, which is also a public data set that's available from NOAA or climate forecasts, right? And then you would get all this device and then you would also say what tools you wanted to do or tools you wanted to use, right? So if I need to do sort of um, imagery analysis, like put some Esri software on there or put open aerial map on there or put open drone map on there, right? Put mapillary software on there. Any of these tools could be deployed to the box and basically at ordering time you just select what data sets you want and what sort of tools you want and then you go ahead and submit that and it can get sent to you uh, and you can walk that into the field, right? Like we are an amazing logistics company if you've ever gotten a package from us. Uh, hopefully it has gone successfully but we do logistics. We're an amazing logistics company but the likelihood that we'll be able to deliver something into a disaster situation is pretty low. So the way that this would probably work is it would get delivered to you and you would walk it in by hand. So we worked with uh, humanitarian open street map team and drone deploy to sort of think through what this might look like from the device side. So uh, you have did the ordering, now you actually have a device. Um, so this is work that Seth had done with HOT and with drone deploy. And so drone deploy, if you're not familiar with them, uh, they can take imagery and they can orthorectify it and give it to you um, on your phone, right? So we said, okay, we'll get that imagery on the device. Uh, and then we look at using open aerial map on the device again. So this is all running on the device in a no network situation, right? So you run open aerial map on the device to do your sort of imagery um, browsing. You could use something like POSM, portable open street map on the device. You can also use this as a server for QGIS. So you can serve tiles from the device uh, onto your laptop because there's no external connectivity, but you can run mesh networks off this device, right? So you can have other users connected into the device. Um, and then the snowball edge, obviously. So these are just some screenshots that came out of that work. So this is an example of using open aerial map to browse before and after imagery. It's an example of using QGIS on a laptop connected to the local network that's being powered off the device. And you can also use things to locally edit, so this is coming from POSM, you can use things to locally edit the base map. Um, and, and like, I'm sure a lot of you already know this, uh, but it's really cool when you can say, with a device running locally in the field, no external connectivity, you can update your base map, right? So people can be out in the fields when they're doing their wellness checks. Uh, they can update base map based on the conditions that they see. And then you can generate new routing directions for people in the field to be able to do the response, right? Um, that's like, like we didn't do this, I don't wanna make it seem like we did this, right? This is all the stuff that you have all done, right? Um, we're just trying to provide some, some other ways to, to run it in the field. Um, so I, I just think it's very cool. So um, I'm gonna switch from the disaster response stuff now and just talk about a couple other data sets that sort of touch on OSM or that could touch on OSM that are also within the public data sets program. Um, so one Kevin alluded to earlier is the SpaceNet data. So this is a collaboration between ourselves, Cosmic Works, Radiant Solutions, and DG. Um, so there's gonna be more talk about SpaceNet coming up. Uh, I call it out, but t tomorrow, Sunday, tomorrow. Um, so I'm just gonna touch on this briefly, but um, the thing that I think is really cool is that SpaceNet is trying to do for aerial machine learning what ImageNet did for traditional CV, computer vision problems. Um, so it's a collection of tools and label training data uh, and challenges to get groups to work on machine learning challenges around aero imagery, uh, which is fantastic. 
Um, I will tell you, uh, we have a service called Recognition. Uh, Amazon has a service called Recognition. It does um, uh, imagery recognition. It works fantastically for people and places and objects. Um, I don't know if it, I forget, somebody told me, I, I, you might be sitting in the room, but they said, oh, I tried this with aerial imagery, right? And I showed it like pictures of uh, like, a, like a forest or something, and it just said, broccoli, broccoli, broccoli. <laughs> so I thought that was great. Um, like this is, not a, this is not a solved problem in, in any sense, right? So I, it, it's great for us to be a part of this uh, and help try and push this field forward. So, um, so it's a series of challenges, but it's also data sets, right? It's long-lived data sets that aren't just tied to a challenge. Uh, so you can go back and get them in the future and you can use them for benchmarking purposes. They're not just put up for one challenge and then they go away a couple months later. Um, so there's a number of cities that are covered, um, a whole lot of buildings and roads that have already been labeled uh, for training purposes. Um, and then there have been a number of competitions that have been run to date. So they've been focused on building footprints, um, road extraction and routing. Um, and then there's another one that's coming up here in the near future, uh, which is uh, off nadir detection, right? And so the thing that's pretty cool about this is this is actually, if you're familiar with the way that satellite imagery is taken, this is like a very space heavy track here, which is cool. Uh, if you're familiar with the way that satellite imagery is taken, uh, it, it's a lot of times taken straight down or close to straight down. That's sort of the, the normal view that, that we have come to expect. But as you might imagine, uh, if you let the satellite take pictures not straight down, but off at an angle, you can take a lot more images. Or, if we go a little bit back to the disaster response context, you can get imagery much more quickly, right? So if a disaster happens somewhere in the world and you wanna get very quick imagery of that, the chances that you're gonna have a pass directly overhead, like that's, that, that's not necessarily a thing that's gonna happen right away, right? But if you can take an image at the side uh, at an oblique angle, um, then you can likely get imagery much more quickly. But it's not clear uh, at least I don't, it's certainly not clear to me because I'm not an expert here, but I don't think it's also clear to the SpaceNet group. Like, will your models work at off nadir angles, right? Um, and to what, to what degree will they work and how far off nadir can you go? Um, so this is a challenge that's gonna be coming out here in the very near future. Also just wanna mention a couple other places where OSM and OpenAQ can interact. Uh, I, oh sorry, where uh, other data sets can interact. Uh, the one I'm gonna talk about now is OpenAQ, uh, which is a nonprofit that aggregates global air quality data. So there's uh, around 300 million air quality measurements from around the world that are, that are stored by this nonprofit uh, as a public data set in AWS. Um, it covers about 67 countries, 9,000 stations. A lot of this data isn't actually available anymore. Uh, a lot of this data is put up temporarily and then it goes away. Right, so you, you, you can't get the data anymore. Some of the data, for some places like the US or the EU, the data is more easily accessible long term. But for a lot of the countries, that's not the case. And so this is a slide that I put in here because I was actually gonna do work and then I didn't get to do it. So maybe I'll just ask you all to do it if you're interested. Um, one of the things that I think would be very cool is if you're familiar with air quality at all, um, there's a big difference between air quality in rural areas, urban areas, and different type of urban areas, right? So it's very important to know when you're looking at a monitoring station, is that monitoring station next to a major road, next to a major artery? Or is it on the outskirts of the city? Is it next to a bus depot? Um, that information is obviously probably in OSM, right? So it'd be very interesting to look at the 9,000 locations that have lat long associated with them within the OpenAQ database, look at their histories of air quality measurements, and try to do an assessment, um, and you could probably do this programmatically, of like, is it do a quick classification of, is it near a bus depot? Is it near a major major roadway? Uh, is it off some other part in the city, right? Is it out in the middle of the country? And that's why, it, that's why the air quality looks so clean. Um, so, like I said, I was gonna do this work and show you stuff, but I didn't get to do it, so I'll just throw it out there in case anyone wants to, wants to do that. Um, another place where we're using OSM for some of our stuff is just add context. So this is Landsat on AWS. Um, we make a bunch of Landsat data available on AWS, um, but we never really had like a great interface to, to browse it ourselves. A bunch of customers have built those interfaces, so we didn't really need to, uh, but we did build something just to sort of so, show off like what you could do. Um, and so the thing is like the, the satellite imagery is 
very beautiful, generally speaking. Um, but it doesn't have any context, right? You're just sort of looking at things, and at least when you're at this resolution, when you're at higher resolutions, you can usually tell what's going on. But at these resolutions, uh, it's hard to see what's going on. Landsat's 30 meters per pixel. So we used OSM to go in and just sort of grab administrative boundaries. Um, this is Detroit. It doesn't have the most information here, at least when I ran this. Uh, but like we also grabbed statues and stuff, and just from clicking around randomly uh, through the Landsat data, there's some weird statues that are out there. Uh, at least there's weird statues in OSM. Um, but so, like, we just used OSM data to add context to, uh, like, beautiful imagery, right? So, um, if you're sort of interested in any of the things I brought up, uh, most notably some of the sort of uh, large scale processing for OSM uh, or the space network, there's some other related talks that are coming up. Um, I think the first one is the workshop with Seth and Jennings later today at four. Um, and then uh, there's another, the longest title of the the, this conference, I assume, uh, is a SpaceNet talk. That's tomorrow uh, at 1.30. And then there's a uh, talk about some uh, Asmesa work uh, 9.30 on Sunday. And so with that, uh, I will stop and see if there's any questions. Thanks. All right. Thank you.